to national security to someone's to someone's security, and that's a very different uh, that's a very different kind of role or place for the nation state to be. Um, even when you look at some quote unquote cyber war actions like the Stuxnet virus that helped, I think helped disable uh, some nuclear reactors or nuclear centrifuges rather in Iran. The resources required to create Stuxnet, while significant, were, were really paltry compared to the resources required to build a nuclear weapon. Yeah. And so the, the, the balance of power, the nature of power is really fundamentally different. It used to be that to wage a war, you had to be a real nation state. You had to have a lot of resources at your disposal. And in our technological era, I just don't think that's true anymore. You can cause, you can wreak havoc and be a very small group of people, not even that well funded. And so the question is, policy-wise, what does that mean for national security, for law enforcement, for the defense, defense, Department of Defense, and, and diplomacy? And I think we're a long way from clear answers on that. And curiously, what I think we, what we need to look for some clues is back to you know, 18th century maritime policy where you were dealing with pirates, right? Because yeah. I think that is very analogous to what we're dealing with today on How's that for a long and not particularly useful answer? <laughs> and it's, it's going somewhere. Um, moving on, uh, on on this topic, uh, so cybersecurity sort of leads up the surveillance state. How do you yeah. how do you see the the surveillance state? And well, recent events with it's, NSA it's, leaks. Oh. It's upsetting to live in a surveillance state. Why? Because historically, surveillance states come hand in hand with different kinds of oppression, injustice, and in fascism. So surveillance states, I think, are dangerous. But the reality is we've been living in a corporate surveillance state for somewhere north of 15 years, at least digitally. Yeah. Uh, your digital actions have been tracked and recorded in ways to help sell you things. And that's that's not upsetting to most people. Not, maybe it shouldn't be, right? The real, the line I got, the real, the real concern is when the NSA, when the government starts spying on citizens without any accountability. I want to put aside for a minute the question of whether or not it's okay to spy on citizens. Let's assume it is because we want to catch terrorists and, and, and fight threats. Let's assume that, that that's okay. We still want some accountability in the system. We want some way to avoid an abuse of power. We want some way to hold the power of the NSA accountable. And it's abundantly clear in every way, shape, and form that it is it has been impossible to hold the NSA accountable with the surveillance power they have. And that is the most terrifying thing, is that there's no accountability. The purpose of this democracy, the reason we have the system of government we have, is to bring accountability to power. And when that is, when that is trampled on, when that is given up, when that is thrown to the wind, that's when the, the founders and framers of the Constitution are are, uh, or we dishonor their their memory. It's, it's a really it's a really dangerous place for us to be. And do you see traditional politics being able to to address this issue oh, substantially wow. and constructively? Or do you, you know, is there a need for some disruption uh, in this field too? I'm not sure our current political systems are able to to to, to address this. That's a short word. Well, at least so far they haven't. I mean, look, if Julian Assange and Edward Snowden are the two men with the moral high ground here, we're in real trouble. Yeah. Um, you mentioned uh, that we've been in a corporate surveillance state for 15 years. So moving on to Google, I guess. Oh. The, the big G. Uh, we have a comment. Uh, I'm just going to read this for, for purpose of simplicity. Uh, Google expanded its reach for years with the motto, don't be evil. <coughs> However, in the last year, it seems there has been a more aggressive policy with the acquisition of a number of new products. And the result, one might argue, is that Google looks more and more like a government uh, trying to enter into all aspects of uh, ordinary life and becoming indispensable, almost like a passport. Uh, do you know if there are any historical precedents of large non-tech companies in this case uh, that have tried to do this? And what do you think we can expect out of, out of this? Very right? interesting comment, right? The, this is an idea I've seen a little bit, the notion that Google is increasingly more of a public utility than a for-profit company, or um, 
trying to remember, there's some business journalist who describes Amazon as a as a, as a as a as a nonprofit organization run for the benefit of consumers, backed by major investors. Right. Uh, this idea that some of these big internet companies take on such an outsized role in the delivery of a range of services that, um, well, certainly you can argue Google every day and Facebook, they make decisions about free speech, they make decisions about the visibility of things on the internet that, that are arguably governmental type decisions. Um, I mean, I, I don't think we actually have very good ways of thinking about or understanding the power of these digital platforms. In my book, I call them even bigger, the seven or eight companies who kind of essentially dominate our online space, Amazon, eBay, Facebook, Google, um, Skype, uh, um, and, one, and Twitter, but there's one other one. Anyway, these big tech companies. Have a, uh, oh, uh, uh, eBay, uh, these big tech companies have this outsized role. They're kind of giant behemoth platform players. There are millions and millions of people who participate on them and use them. And they tend not to have significant competitors, which gives them a, you know, I don't think anybody would be concerned about Google if there were other significant search engines out there, right? Uh, and you could, I guess you could argue there are, but um, there's no doubt Google wields a kind of power that's unusual, historically, even monopolistic. And that crosses over into the public sphere because of the, because of the control that gives Google over people's uh, information about, about public issues. Yeah. Um, I want to go back, jump back a little bit to, to social media. And um, we have a question or a comment with a question. She goes, the internet and social media have significant potential to enhance democratic participation and empower and engage voters and activists. However, as you noticed in the wake of the Boston bombings, there's a significant amount of misinformation. How can we counter the abundance of misinformation on the internet and social media, if at all? And what if implications do you feel misinformation has on the democratic process? Well, this gets back to when I was talking about that gap between institutions and technology. Yeah. If everybody has a smartphone, of course people are going to want to participate in investigations. Of course people are going to go looking for the Boston bombers. And we need to give them, we need to channel that energy into our institutions in a way that's going to produce the best outcomes, not lead to vigilante hunts, right? I mean, it's a, um, at the heart of it, how do how do how do we deal with the digital spaces? Our institutions have to open up. They have to more readily engage with the internet, with the digital world. That's ultimately how we do it. We have to bring together these big institutions with the power of individuals and figure out ways of, of merging them, of, of having them inform each other. Yeah. Well, the values of big institutions are hard won. Yeah. We don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Right? There's a follow-up question to that, uh, which is a very interesting. If it is possible to develop norms and values for social media so that there's more credibility in the things that people say on the internet. I mean, I, I think that it is possible. I think that basically the internet's very young. You know, I mean, it took newspapers 100 years to develop norms for sourcing and for and for and for and for combating libel and right yellow journalism. I mean it took a long time for the ethics and norms of newspapers to get worked out. We're at the very beginning of it digitally. And it'll get worked out eventually digitally. It just might take a long time, like decades and decades, a hundred years, and it and it might come at a great collateral cost in the meantime. So you just said the internet is a very young thing. So that, that makes this next question perfect. It comes from, from Vietnam, from uh, Nguyen Thi Lan Wong, who is a lecturer at the Binh Quang University. Uh, and, and he's asking if, in your opinion, Vietnam has a chance to become a new Goliath by developing an internet-based economy. Well, um, the, uh, I think that, that, that the future of power holds a much stronger digital component, much larger digital component than any ever before. 
So Vietnam wants to develop a powerful economy. Vietnam wants to be a player on the global global stage. Then, then understanding and embracing digital technology is a really essential part of that of that journey. And just just look at, you know, here's Obama's signature accomplishment in his two-term presidency is the health care law. The health care law that's almost been brought to its knees by a website that didn't work. Yeah. And that's just an example of the way that the digital technology has intertwined itself very tightly with the nature of power. And the being powerful today in the future, being a compelling leader, being a successful businessman or businesswoman, being a good teacher, I mean, across the board, whatever your pursuit is, whatever your purpose is, having power in that purpose requires a digital literacy, requires a thoughtful component of both to it. Um, we have a question from Ahmed Kilani out of Egypt uh, that sort of goes along this uh, potential of the internet. Uh, and he's wondering uh, what opportunities you see for the internet to help poor countries, uh, the countries where you grew up in, for example, in Africa, Southeast Asia. Uh, in, in 2014, what opportunities are there in Africa to leverage uh, technology and the internet to? Yeah, that's an interesting lives. question. Uh, I mean, my specialty really is U U.S. politics, but uh, it's clear that in some ways the digital technology allows different kinds of leapfrogging, different kinds of advances. No doubt, mobile phones have transformed the developing world, but I think it also brings with it new, uh, new, new kinds of instability, new risks, new challenges. It is, it is not a um, it's a mixed bag, good and bad, but one thing is clear is it is inevitable. Yeah. And so the best thing to do is to get inside it, to understand the pros and the cons, to try and get a sense of what's happening, <laughs> trying to understand how it affects the development of the economy, the power of public opinion. Mm -hmm. we, we have a 3D printer right here in your office. and. Uh, what do you think is the impact of these new technologies on, on the creation of jobs in the future in the United States? There, there is a recent book by, by two MIT researchers, Andrew McAfee and, and Eric Brynjolfsson, Race Against the Machine, and now the, the new book, uh, Machine and the Second Machine Age, uh, in which they argue that, that with technology advances, uh, we're going to lose a lot of jobs because people are going to be replaced by machines, and the pace at which people develop new skills is not keeping up with. Yeah, well, I think, I think it's, a, it's a great book. I highly recommend it. It's very provocative and interesting. And I definitely think the nature of work has changed. I mean, in the United States now, I mean, I don't know the exact numbers, but approximately a third of the workforce is contingent, and another third of the workforce is self-employed. And so you're actually talking about a very small number of people who have kind of nine to five traditional jobs. There's lots, there's lots of work. I'm not sure there are jobs, right? And so I think that one of the challenges, talk about a gap between the institutions, government, and policymakers, and the realities of our technology and our economy, is that the way we work isn't um, the way we think about work is about jobs. A lot of our policies, like health insurance, for example, are built around employment and jobs. But I'm not sure jobs look anything like they look 25 or 50, certainly not 50 years ago, and I don't really think 25 years ago. They just, jobs don't look like that anymore. Yeah. So how, how should we educate the, the younger generations to, to prepare them for, for the economy of the future? And I guess we're, we're in, a, in a, an institute of higher education and how, how do you see higher education evolve? Well, I mean, part of the thesis of my book is not just about pushing power to individuals. It's also about the way institutions have not done a good job, that when people are dissatisfied with the state of things, they use the technology to disrupt, right? That insurgents don't win when people are happy. Insurgents win when people feel like they're not being well served. And so in higher education in the United States, this is particularly acute. The cost of a four-year college education has skyrocketed. Economic value has plummeted. 
you know, it's more expensive than ever to get a degree, and it's harder for it to ever be worth anything. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, something about that equation is dramatically wrong. Right? You asked me, how do we build and prepare people for the economies of the future? I'm not entirely sure, but I'm, but I am pretty sure it doesn't look like the way we're doing it right now. Yeah. Which is plunging people into dramatic amounts of debt without any hope of ever getting out. Sorry. Okay. I'm, I'm familiar with the problem. <laughs> Definitely. Um, I want to go back to the the topic of social media and the Arab Spring because we have a former student of yours that sent in a question and a comment, uh, which which uh, ties in with a with a recent report that comes out of the United States Peace Institute, uh, whose findings and the findings of the report argue that actually Twitter and Bitly links did didn't play that big of a role uh, in uh, in fostering and and spreading the Arab Spring. Uh, rather, they helped uh, people on the outside, so us, they helped us uh, see, it. see it, but people that were in, it didn't really mobilize them. How, how do you? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not surprised about that, uh, necessarily. I mean, I'm not sure, well, well, I'll start by saying, I don't believe that technology is the be all and all. It's not like just drop Facebook in somewhere and everything changes. It's just, it just doesn't work like that. Egypt had a long tradition of, uh, of political opposition and labor unions advocating for change for decades. There, there was a lot of forces at work of which the technology is one of them. On the other hand, I don't think the technology is irrelevant. Uh, you know, Wally Gwenem, who is one of the lead organizers of the Arab Spring in Egypt at Tahrir Square, wrote a book about the role Facebook played in their organizing yeah. and the way they used it to uh, shape protests and challenge the government. And so it's a it's a tricky kind of line to walk. On the one hand, there's clear power in it. On the other hand, it's not enough. It's not all there is. In fact, sometimes it's not very much power, but it is some power, right? Um, uh, Jenny Morozov has written quite compelling and elegantly about the way it can empower, you know, um, like in Syria, they used it to hunt down pro democracy activists and kill them. And yeah. Unfriendly regimes are quite fond of the internet for the way for the opportunities it offers for surveillance and for propaganda. So it's not it's not without its significant challenges. There is a Um, but it's also not without significant opportunities. It's a mixed bag. And what I want most is I want us to come at it clear-eyed and thoughtful and with critical thinking and to imagine the world we want to help us figure out how to get there. Because it's not what's happening right now. People either ignoring it, putting their heads in the sand, or they're being absolutely too utopian about what it means. And neither of those things is an appropriate response. Yeah. Uh, we're almost very towards the end of, of our hour. Um, we're we're in the Harvard Schoenstein Center for the Press. I'm going to talk a little bit about the press, and you you mentioned it uh, throughout your book and multiple times the the, the demise of, of big media and and how investigative journalism is suffering. Um, we had a talk about a month ago with a colleague of yours, uh, Patterson, Professor Patterson, who was presenting his book, uh, Informing the News. Uh, did you did you discuss the ideas uh, in your that you present in your book with the ones he presents in his book? What synergies do you see, or where do you see them differ? Well, there's no doubt that the internet has changed the nature of news gathering, news production, news distribution. On all three fronts, the technology has really had an impact, and it's been a, it is a mixed record. In some ways, it's fantastic. In some ways, it's not. I think one of the things that Professor Patterson really um, was trying to understand is the impact that that's had on actual news, on real reporting, and it's not it's not a good one in many ways. It's not a it's a it's a dangerous story. We were talking earlier about the informed citizen and the, the role of an of of a citizen in democracy, the responsibilities and the challenges that presents in a age of fragmented media where disinformation is. Uh, the very fact that Tom has to, the very fact that Professor Patterson has to coin a term, you know, knowledge-based journalism. I think there was, for, for a brief interregnum of maybe 50 years, and most people assumed that journalism was knowledge-based. 
but you can't make that assumption anymore. Yeah, yeah. I feel like we would have spent 50 minutes talking, and, and the term radical connectivity didn't really. Yeah, come well, to this is that's a, that's a good point. I, I struggled to write a book to figure out how to talk about or describe our technology. Technology, nah, the wheels technology, cars are technology. Smartphone, that seems like a weak word to describe what's going on with phones. The internet doesn't quite capture it because really it's as much about mobile phones as it is about the internet. We just don't have good language to talk about what's going on. And I was trying to figure out how to describe it because if phone is not right, mobile is not right, and internet's not right, I kind of came up with radical connectivity, which is radically connected all the time everywhere with enormous power and no um you know no priority or hierarchy and that's a that is it's a it's a it's a deep-seated challenge for authority well, one of the examples that you bring up uh, of the potential of radical connectivity is the 1000 through fans and that, that artists could if they reach a 1000 through fan base that supports them with a hundred dollars a year they make you make a substantial living yeah. A decent living. Do you, do you see this as being a possibility for, for uh, independent media outlets that, that sort of have building a, a true fan base that really goes into the, the investigative and, and tackles this corporate dominated? Detail? Well, I would say that um, I would say that as our institutions are doing a good job, the, the incentive to build alternatives using our technology grows. And the deep question I, or not the deep question, but the question I care about is uh, what, are the, what are the core values of the institution? Why does the institution exist? And can those values be distributed or replicated or brought to the new models, new things that are be cre being created as alternatives? And that's especially challenging when we look at any kind of creative activity writers, musicians, artists, compensating creative people is, is growing more and more challenging in the yeah. digital world. And so one, one way of trying to do that is the thousand true fans theory by Kevin Kelly, which is that a thousand people give you a hundred bucks and you can build a compelling revenue stream uh, to, to do your art. Yeah. And do you think that might have a future outside of the arts? Sort of like bottom up, yeah. You know, that's interesting. That's what Kickstarter is, right? Kickstarter yeah. is essentially the thousand true fans model. Um, I think that where that's a challenge is actually more in the is actually a little bit more in the journalism space, especially investigative journalism. Yeah. So, how, how are we gonna keep getting or get more of the high quality investigative journalism. Funding high quality investigative journalism is a big question mark in the future. There's no doubt. It's one of the challenges that we're facing. So we have a couple more questions before we cut you loose. Um, what are you going to work on next? What do you have any other book plans? Oh. Well, uh, I'm interested in the question of what does what does what does a hierarchical institution that carries a lot of power do in a digital age of flat distributed power? How do how does Harvard, how does the White House, how do big traditional institutions engage with the realities of the internet where anybody can do anything? Yeah. And to try and understand what might work, what potential models might be, I want to look at totally digital native institutions like Wikipedia, like the Hacker Collective Anonymous. Understand how they work and what motivates them and how are they different from traditional institutions and structures. I'm hoping to unlock some ideas and opportunities there. Yeah. Finally, one last question. So I was reading reviews to your book on, on Amazon reviews, which is <laughs> The, the you know the end of fake. I don't go on the New York book review. I I read the reviews on Amazon, and and one of the first reviews supposedly came from your mother. I'm sure it did. And and she had a question for you, I guess not for you, but I'm going to ask it to you. And it is, uh, where are we going with this? 
Well, I wrote the book because I'm a little concerned about where we're going because I think that that we're not approaching our world with enough intentionality and thoughtfulness. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, uh, so some more questions. There are more questions. And um, Hang Huang from uh, Paris, you can try to. Let's see. Yeah. Yeah. Good question. Hang Huang from Paris. Uh, do you think internet can help balance uh, global information flow? Yeah. yeah. Do you yeah. think the internet can help balance the global information information flow, or just reinforce the one way flow of information? I have no doubt it has already balanced the, the flow of information. That's what WikiLeaks is about. That's what everything's known is about. That kind of disruption to the way information is managed and controlled. Yeah. Maybe, maybe um, again. Yes, and also question from Nguyen Hà Quân, co-founder of SkinNet, yeah, about we would like to get your comment about uh, CEO of Cisco, uh, John Chambers, yeah, yeah. yeah, he wrote on uh, on um, Davos uh, World Economic Forum. Yes, Actually, you can yeah. see. Yes, we, we can just read you the quote. Yes. I got this one. I was out already. So we have a quote by John Chamber of Cisco, who said, "The Internet of Everything is a connection of people, data, process, and things. It is revolutionizing the way we do business, transforming communication, job creation, education, and healthcare healthcare across the globe." As we're beginning to witness, when we connect people, communities, cities, even countries, amazing thing, things are possible. Fueling the internet of everything is, grow, is growing the number of people and things connecting to the internet. There will be more mobile phone devices and smartphones connected than the total global population by 2015. By 2020, more than 5 billion people will be connected, not to mention 50 billion things. And it's not just devices you'd expect will be connected, such as tablets but other phys physical objects that can sense and share information. Um, I see 2014 as the inflection point for this major technolo technology transition, which I predict will have a much bigger impact on the world than the first 20 years of the internet. What are your comments about this quote? Well, there's no doubt that oh, that uh, radical connectivity plays in here, right? I mean, we just this big tech news this week is the acquisition of Nest by Google. And you know, Nest was very successful because it built thermostats and smoke detectors that communicate with each other and with you and with your phone. A kind of connectivity, it's kind of ambient device awareness in a sense. And you know, I can imagine a day, 3D printing. I can imagine a day when you leave your house to go to a conference, and your phone notices you've left the house. It looks at your calendar. It knows where you're going. It's watching your car drive you there and it uh, sends a message ahead to the conference center uh, with the coordinates for your back, and the conference center prints a chair with a 3D printer molded and designed it for your back, so you get to your meeting or your conference and you have your chair with your name on it, and you're sitting in it, and it's just for you, right? That's a, a world where things are customized and built to your personal satisfaction. But that, is a, that is a world that empowers individuals at the expense of, uh, of uh, potentially, potentially the expense of civic life and community. And so that's a, that is also something we've got to bring some real intentionality to. So that's how we want that to be. All right. Thank you so much for Thank you. doing this with us. You see. Nico, thank you so much. That thank you very much, John. Yeah, great uh, talking and sharing. And uh, thank you for your attention and uh, attend uh, um, Nico talk on uh, Boston Global Forum Leaders City. And uh, uh, there are a lot of questions. Uh, we uh, thank you for your sending questions. But uh, the time limit, only uh, 60 minutes. So we are only choose a, a part of that. So we hope to continue info and attend uh, Boston Global Forum event in uh, uh, meet Boston Global Forum's leader series uh, next time. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be a part of this community. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, but, but just a moment, just a moment. I, we have to record.
Macht's gut. Bye, bye.